All right, well, it looks like most people have joined us. Um, so good evening. My name is Eric Carpio. I'm with History Colorado. Um, I'm, I'm at the Fort Garland Museum and Cultural Center in Fort Garland, Colorado in the beautiful San Luis Valley. Tonight's event is part of History Colorado's Borderlands of Southern Colorado online lecture series offered by History Colorado Museums, El Pueblo History Museum, Fort Garland Museum and Cultural Center, and the Trinidad History Museum. Before we begin tonight's program in the spirit of healing and education, we acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribes with historic ties to the state of Colorado. These tribes are our partners. We consult with them when we plan exhibits, collect, preserve, and interpret artifacts, do archeological work, and create educational programs. We recognize these indigenous peoples as the original inhabitants of this land. As always, I'd like to thank the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area and Colorado State University Pueblo for their continued support of our lecture series. History Colorado members can deepen their involvement and support the, uh, in support of the Borderlands of Southern Colorado initiative by joining uh, Fronteras, the Bro Borderlands of Southern Colorado Society. This is brand new this year. By making a contribution to join Fronteras, you are connecting to others who share your special interest in the understanding and scholarship of the borderlands of Southern Colorado. When you make your contribution by February 23rd, you can participate in the very first scheduled online activity for Fronteras, which is discovering the history of San Carlos de los Jupes on February 24th. This special access conversation is open only to members of the society you can find more information and join Fronteras at h-co.org backslash Fronteras. And we'll drop that link in the chat box. We would like to thank and welcome the original charter members of the society, um, Constance and Kevin from Centennial, Judy from Loveland, Janie and James from Colorado Springs, Virginia from Denver, uh, Lois and Olin from Levita, Jennifer from Denver, Linda and Stephen from Denver, Marion and Walter from Denver, Ellen and Lorenzo from Westminster, Arthur from Colorado Springs, Mary from Brooklyn, New York, and Suzanne from Del Norte. Tonight's talk is Food in the Borderlands, including Colorado, presented by Gustavo Ariano. Gustavo is a columnist for the LA Times, the author of Taco USA, How Mexican Food Conquered America, and a guest on Netflix's, Netflix's Taco Chronicles. We hope you enjoy tonight's program. Gustavo, welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. Um, wow, this is really exciting. 129, 130 people, you know, all via Zoom, all across the country. Most of you with uh, connections to Colorado, some of you just interested in learning what on earth, you know, you took my bait and I, I plugged something, something that usually people don't talk about outside of Colorado. Pueblo Mex and Denmex. What on earth is that? I would have never even known about this cuisine if it wasn't for a book that I wrote. And I, I'm going to be like a magician just throwing out props. But if it wasn't for this book that I wrote in 2012 called Taco USA, How Mexican Food Conquered America. And it's a history. It, I mean, at this point, it's 2012. So it's almost a decade old. But it's a history of Mexican food in the United States, especially in its regionality. So one of the things that I did I did in the book is just explain sort of the difference between the food in New Mexico versus the food in Texas. Texas, of course, its own country, like five different styles of cuisines from Houston to Dallas to El Paso to Calmex to all, all around the country. But the, the, the cuisine that surprised me the most, just because I had no idea that it existed, was the Mexican food of Colorado. And in the book, I, um, I deemed a Mexican hamburger, which I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of the game here, but I deemed a Mexican ha hamburger at Chubby's in Denver, the best Mexican dish in the United States. It is absolutely glorious, but I have to admit with shame, my travels did not take me to Pueblo. My travels did not take me to the San Luis Valley. I idiotically assumed, oh, Pueblo, I remember Pueblo, I remember actually from a commercial in the 1980s where you would send, I think for uh, some contest, you'd send your address to Pueblo, Colorado, as that's how they would pronounce it. And so I sadly did not, uh, it, I didn't, I, I think there might've been one mention to Pueblo in my book and that's about it. But I have to say, 
my travels have now taken me to Pueblo. My travels have taken me to some parts of the San Luis Rio Valley and I, or, or San Luis Valley, sorry. And San Luis Rio Colorado is down in, um, in Sonora. And I have to say it is one of the greatest cuisines of Mexican food in the United States of the cuisine that developed in and of its own. It is absolutely magnificent. It is criminally unknown. So what I plan to do today for this lecture, if I was in Pueblo and folks, once this damn pandemic is over, I am making a beeline to Pueblo, spending a couple of days there and just eating as much uh, Pueblo Mex food as possible and lecturing live. But since we are having some people who are not from Pueblo, who have never maybe, maybe even been to Pueblo, I'm gonna try to explain sort of the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a brief history of Pueblo uh, Mexican food, of Den Mex food, put in its context. Of course, I have to explain the connection between Pueblo and New Mexico. And of course, I'm gonna have to talk about the rivalry with the chilies between Pueblo and Hatch and New Mexico and just sort of the, the craziness that goes with it. You see, you see, it's already starting right here with Roberta, my friend from Pasadena. There is no Colorado or Pueblo chili without New Mexico, absolutely. So before we begin everything, of course, uh, you all have your drinks at home, whether it's water or whatever. I'm keeping it Colorado today. So I'm cracking open this bottle of Stranahan's. Stranahan's is an awesome whiskey that I first came across when I started, really started paying, uh, going to Denver about, geez, at this point, 15 years ago or whatever. I've been saving this one, which is now sold in Orange County for a special occasion. Uh, it's famously Stranahan's would come with a tin cup. This one has like a rubber thing around it with a tin cup inside. So I'm gonna pour myself. I'm not gonna drink the whole bottle. I'm not gonna get drunk, but I do have to, uh, you know, shout out Stranahan's, shout out your Colorado. Salud, everyone, raise your uh, hands, please, or raise your toast, and salud to Pueblo, salud to Colorado, salud to San Luis Valley, salud to Walsenburg, Trinidad, and Denver, of course, all those good stuff. I don't have Walter's beer, sorry. Ooh, that's such good stuff. It's, it's a sherry cask. And just to show you how much I love the Pueblo Mex food, here's a jar of Pueblo salsa uh, medium. Uh, the museum, you know, the El Pueblo Museum, they kindly, uh, or, you know, they kindly offered um, a stipend for me, you know, just because usually that's what you do, but I declined it because I understand how difficult it is right now for all museums. So my, you know, instead I said, can you give me a gift basket of, uh, you know, of food, uh, of items that can be sold out here in California from Pueblo. And so they sent me this, I kid you not, my wife and I, we opened it, we finished it like in 30 minutes. I thought it was gonna be, oh, I could last me a couple of days or whatnot. Nope, finished it in about half an hour. If anyone from the Pueblo, uh, Chamber of Com Pueblo Chamber of Commerce is paying attention, folks, I sent you an email. My, wa my wife wants to sell this at her store. She has a market in Delhi that sells food of the borderlands. None of you ever responded. Come on, email me. Let's get this out in, Cal in California and make it as popular as Hatch. So when we talk about Pueblo cuisine, when we talk about Denver cuisine, when we talk about like the food items, especially for those of you who are not here or not from Colorado, you have to ask yourself, well, what differentiates it? What makes it different from say the food in California? How are their burritos different from ours? How are their tacos different from ours? So we have to set sort of a base of what makes Colorado Mexican food. And to do that though, we have to go south. We have to go to the land of enchantment and we have to go to New Mexico. And, you, and so a little bit of history, of course, the oldest quote unquote Mexican food in the United States, its own regional food is New Mexican cuisine. That started the moment Spaniards started going up to uh, New Mexico around like up in Northern New Mexico through La Jornada de la Muerte. We're talking about the late 1500s, really the 1600s. They, of course, uh, you know, you, uh, the polite way I guess to say it now is contact with the indigenous folks. And from that grew Mexican food, just like it happened in Mexico itself. So at the base of all New Mexican cuisine, of course, is the three sisters. You have your you know, corn, you have your chilies, and it's, you know, with the focus on the chilies. And of course, you, know, you have your, your squash, sometimes you have your beans or whatnot, but that makes that foundation of uh, New Mexican food. Also very important is pork. pork from pork, you start getting carne bovada, which uh, for those of you who are not from Colorado or New Mexico, it's basically, but it's kind of like an al pastor, but I would argue it's a better al pastor. But really the primacy of the cuisine of New Mexico is based on the chili, on the red and the green. There's still debate as to whether it was the Spaniards who brought up the chili to New Mexico or whether it was indigenous folks who already had the chili. 
I would say, honestly, it's the indigenous folks because corn started in, geez, I think the, the you know, corn started in the Valley of Mexico and made it made, made its way across the Americas because, hello, uh, indigenous folks traded just like everyone else. So the chili peppers had to go up because how can you not want to keep, how, how can you not want to get chili on you? Red chili, green chili, in New Mexico, folks grew chili wherever they had a chance. And so we're talking about cuisine that's already been developed for about 200 years. I mean, we can't, as Americans, we can't conceive, uh, you know, a, a, a cuisine or Mexicans being in the United States, New Mexicans being uh, anywhere before uh, Plymouth Rock, anywhere before the Mayflower or Jameson or whatever, but it was happening in New Mexico. So over 200 years, you start, you start developing this unique cuisine and then, and this is where I don't know all my history, so I'm just going by what I know. At some point, the folks in northern New Mexico, they decided, hey, we want to go travel up north to the, you know, across what's now Raton, across that pass, and we're going to start settling what's now, you know, what's now known as the state of Colorado. So by the 1850s, 1860s, uh, early 1850s, yep, Roberta knows what's up, early 1850s, you start seeing people from New Mexico going into Southern Colorado, going up to around to Denver, but really uh, focusing on the San Luis Valley because it's so verdant on those, you know, starts creating those small towns spreading across. And they have, you know, and those people, they gave themselves a nickname. It's from New Mexico. They call themselves Manitos. It's short for Hermanitos, you know, little brothers. That Manito culture came from it and it's so it's basically cousins. What happened in you know the folks, the old school folks, the people who've been in Colorado five, six generations, there are cousins with the folks of New Mexico. They acknowledge it, but hey, cousins are not brothers and sisters. So things start developing on their own. And especially in Southern Colorado, what you start seeing is like all Mexican food has, it's this multiculturalism, this connection with other groups, and you start creating new dishes or new ideas of how to see Mexican food. So in Southern Colorado, of course, in Pueblo especially, and also like Trinidad, the big, the other big ethnic group that started establishing itself was the Italians. A little bit of an aside and maybe a controversial aside, but when I had the chance to travel to Pueblo, I, you know, coming down from Denver, I made sure to uh, pay my respects at the Ludlow Monument. As someone who comes from the left, I had known, of course, about the Ludlow Massacre uh, in the, you know, someone will, of course, give the date there, but basically there was a massacre from Rockefeller, uh, John D. Rockefeller's goons, where they killed a bunch, uh, or they burned down, they killed people, and then women and children were killed, incinerated, be all because their husbands, their fathers, they were going on strike uh, in, in the fields around there. So as a result, you had about 20 some people that I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the, the number of folks. But I remember when I was young reading the names of it and it struck me like, okay, there's Mexicans here, but there's also Italian uh, last names going on there. That's incredible. Like, like, what was, you know, what was that about? So as you know, if, uh, what was that about? It was these cultures were living side by side. These cultures were creating, uh, not just food, but also growing food. So you start seeing the first big crops of chili, what ended up becoming the mirasol pepper, which is uh, otherwise known as, a, and Greeks as well, yep, otherwise known as the Pueblo pepper, started growing in, in at, you know, big time in the San Luis Valley starting in the 1920s, starting to spread across there. So flash forward then, of course, the people in Pueblo, they start moving up to Denver, the people in Denver, pretty far away, two hours away, um, I think maybe two and a half hours from Pueblo, I, I forget when I drove it, you start seeing two completely distinct cuisines happening in Pueblo, in Denver. So I'm actually going to start with the Denver cuisine first, because that's the one that I first learned about. I started going to Denver um, 2007, because I used to write a column called Ask a Mexican. And when, you know, Ask a Mexican is exactly what it sounded like. People would send me questions about Mexicans, and I would answer them. For some reason, I, I well, I, I guess I know now why, because the Colorado Mexicans are pretty cool. They're cooler than some other Mexicans, and we'll just leave it at that. But they took an immediate liking to my column to the point where, even though I'm based in Orange County, California, Denver became the second most popular market for Ask a Mexican, even a bigger market than Albuquerque, which was the, the, the first place to carry Ask a Mexican outside of, of California. So when I fly out to Denver, uh, for the uh, for a book signing at the Tattered Cover, uh, I was hosted there by the editor of Westward, which is the legendary alt weekly up there, Patty Calhoun. So she's like, "Hey, I know you're interested in Mexican food. Do you want to try the cuisine of Mexican, the Mexican cuisine that we have here in Colorado?" I'm like, "Yeah, sure." So I was expecting, you know, the cuisine from Southern California, burritos that you hold, 
tacos al pastor, carnitas, all that stuff, maybe some pambazos, a little bit of everything. Nope. We go and I try something. She's like, uh, you want to have a Mexican hamburger? I'm like, yeah, okay. So I'm expecting like, you know, your Ortega burger, which we call the green chili cheeseburger in California. We'll get to California in a little bit. Um, that's what I was expecting. Instead, what's in front of me is a big, huge burrito covered in a gravy. And I have no idea what this is. I thought it was a wet burrito. We call it a wet burrito, but they, they tell me it's um, it's a smothered burrito. I'm like, what's smothered about this burrito? I see it as a wet burrito. And what the hell is this orange gravy in front of me? And she tells me it's chili sauce. I'm like, that's chile? This is not chile. I've never seen this chile before in my experience as a Mexican. It's not definitely the chili con carne of Texas and whatnot. Um, and so she's like, no, try it, dig in. So I try it. It's cheesy and it's spicy, this orange goop. I think it's gravy, but it's super, super spicy. And in the middle, I figure out, oh, now I know why it's a Mexican hamburger because there's a hamburger patty right in the middle of this. I think it's great. And I wondered like, hey, like, is this a only to Denver thing? And, and I was also hanging out with the Chicanos from Denver and they're like, what do you mean? It's only a Denver thing. Yeah, like we don't have in California. They're like, wait, you don't eat Mexican hamburgers in California? No, like we have wet, wet burritos. What are wet burritos? I'm like, it's this, but it's, it's an enchilada sauce. It's not this gravy. Um, and that's when I realized like, that, okay, this must be its own thing. Then I go to another restaurant. I had it, by the way, at Chubby's, Chubby Burger Drive-In, which is this legendary stop off of Lipan. And I think it's 38 um, in uh, Colorado, in Denver. Then I go to another restaurant called La Fiesta. So same thing here. And the, so I order tacos. The tacos are hard shelled. I'm like, we don't eat hard shell tacos in Cal Southern, Cal excuse me, in Southern California anymore. Um, but I see chile relleno. So I'm like, I got to try this chile relleno. I'm expecting this big, long chile relleno made with a, like a poblano pepper or Anaheim pepper. Maybe not the Anaheim pepper, but we'll get to that in a little bit as well. Um, instead, I get this small squat pepper and it's fried because it was wrapped in, um, in a wonton wrapper. And I'm like, this is a chile, a chile relleno. And what's a small little chili? And they're like, oh, it's Pueblo chili. I'm like, what's Pueblo chili? Oh, it's this really good chili. By then I knew what Hatch was. So they're like, it's this really great chili. It's kind of like a New Mexico pepper, but it's better. And I taste it. I'm like, this isn't a uh, chile relleno, but I'll try. I'm like, damn. This is some really, really good food. What the hell's going on with Denver and its own style of Mexican food? So as I kept going to Denver every single year, I kept eating more and more like this unique cuisine and all that stuff. So it made, I made it, it made it into Taco USA. I declared the Mexican hamburger the Mex best Mexican dish in the United States because I was able to tell the story of the Mexican hamburger. Uh, it first started popping up in restaurants in Denver in the 1970s, but it was made famous at Chubby Burger Drive-In by a woman named Stella Cordova. And Stella, I don't know, Karen, if you're related to Stella, but Stella, I read a biography of Stella that was written by Westward, and she was a native of Walsenburg. And I just thought the name Walsenburg was really cool. So I'm like, oh, cool. Like, where's, you know, I Google Walsenburg. It's like down in Southern Colorado, some small town. I'm always fascinated. I'm always fascinated by, you know, small town culture and whatnot. So I'm like, oh, I should go there one day, just you know, just do a story, see if they acknowledge Stella as like, the, or, or even if there's a Mexican hamburger uh, down in Southern Colorado. But I didn't have the chance. I, you know, I'm not just an author. I'm also, you know, I'm a reporter. At the time, I was uh, the editor of my own newspaper. So I kind of had to drop the Mexican food thing for a while. But over the years, I kept picking up more and more and more and more. Finally, flash forward to 2018. In 2018, Su Teatro in the, in the fall, Su Teatro uh, here, let's do a quick cameo. There's Hook right there. Um, old dogs are the best, adopted dogs are the best. 2018, Su Teatro in Denver, legendary Chicano theater. They've invited me because they want to, um, they want to uh, adapt my Ask a, Mex my Ask a Mexican uh, column into, into a play. And I, you know, if you've ever been to Denver Su Teatro, the third oldest Chicano theater company in the United States, they do amazing, amazing stuff. And 
I've been, you know, I, I've worked with them in the past and I've said, of course, I, I trust you folks with it. I don't trust anyone else with it. So go for it. So they had a brunch for me at the, at uh, the um, Tony Castro, uh, he's the executive director of Sutatro. They have a brunch with me and one of the actresses there, uh, Felice, I don't know if Felicia is here, Felicia Perez Gallegos, of course, Corky Gonzalez in Denver, but that's a whole other thing. Uh, Felicia Perez Gallegos, she's like, I know you like tortillas. I know you're a big, you know, big fan of Mexican food. So I'm gonna make you uh, some Pueblo style tortillas. My family's from Pueblo. I'm gonna make them fresh for you. And I'm like, oh, that's it. Like, thank you. Of course, of course, I'll take, uh, of course, I'll take tortillas anytime, especially fresh tortillas. Um, so she brings them out. And they're tortillas I had never seen. And a, a quick, uh, you know, uh, como se dice, a quick aside. I run a tortilla tournament down in Southern California where I match up corn versus flour tortillas. Think of it like a sports tournament. Um, honey, you have to get, you have to get them. Sorry, folks. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, sorry. Hooks. Hooks. Okay. Um, you, uh, you have to, you know, I'd run this, uh, this tortilla tournament. So I've had tortillas of all kinds, Tex-Mex, New Mexico, whatever. And then I get this Pueblo style tortilla. It's thick. It's almost like pita bread. It's salty and it's so delicious. I'm like, I have never had this before. I'm actually going to go, I'm going to drive by Pueblo because I have to go to Albuquerque for, you know, I was taking big road trips. I'm like, I have to go to Albuquerque. So where can I get these tortillas? And if I'm going to be in Pueblo for a couple of hours, where, where, where can I eat? So she's like, okay, you got to go to these two places that I think are great. Estela's Mill Stop and uh, Polito's Beer Barrel. Okay. So what do I order? you got to get the chicken tacos on white. And I'm like, what are chicken tacos on white? What's the white? It's like, it's a flour tortilla. I'm like, all right. Uh, so I go, I was only able to go to Politos that first time. And oh my God, the chicken tacos on white. So again, the, the people in Pueblo know what I'm talking about, but if not, in Pueblo, they make their uh, chicken or their, this, these chicken tacos, they make it on flour tortillas, but they fry the flour tortillas. And so it's thick. All of a sudden it tastes like a fried pita chip. It is absolutely amazing, but I was on the road. So I just had these, I believe those beer barrel, by the way, is an awesome, I hope it's still around, it still has yet. I, um, I hope it's still around because I, of course, I don't know with this pandemic what's happened, but it's just your classic neighborhood bar. Um, and I just went and I just kept driving down. And as I'm driving down, you know, I'm going through Walsenburg, Trinidad, I'm like, I wonder how the food is in these small, good, good Teresa, thank you. I'm, I wonder how these, what the food is in these other restaurants. I got to figure out a way to come back here and stop in Walsenburg and stop in Trinidad and spend more time in Pueblo. And more importantly, I need to do something that's going to be able to promote these, uh, like tell these um, dishes to the rest of the United States. As a reporter, you want to be someone who tells stories that people are going to want to read. And I know for a fact, if you're not from Colorado, you have, you real rare, and sorry, sorry, Pueblo, but this is honest. Unless you're from Colorado, you really, or Northern New Mexico, you really don't pay much attention to Pueblo. You don't. I mean, you barely pay attention to Denver or the rest of Colorado, unless it's bad news, of course, you don't, even though uh, Colorado is a cool state. So, I, so I go to eater.com, which is a national food website, and I tell them, I want to do a story tracking chili. Because remember, chili is from New Mexico, or at least came from New Mexico and went up to Colorado. So I want to do something about the Great American Chili Highway. So I go from I-25 from Las Cruces, New Mexico, from Cruces right there. And really, it should start in El Paso, but let's just start with where I-25 starts. From Las Cruces, go up Color uh, New Mexico, Socorro go up to Albuquerque, go through Santa Fe, go through all of that and end up in Colorado. They love the idea. I was able to do that. When was it? It was the weekend before Thanksgiving. It was, it was Thanksgiving week. I remember this because this I, I had to do it at the last moment. It was Thanksgiving week. Um, it, it was Thanksgiving week in on 2018. And the way it worked out, because I wanted to start in Las in Cruces, I flew into Colorado. I drove all the way down to El Paso and what, like I got there to like, uh, no, to Cruces like midnight or whatever, slept, woke up the next day, started eating my way up. So I'm gonna share for you this Eater article just so you can see it. Wow, 142 people now. Hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna share with you really quickly this uh, thing. 
uh, this article that I did. I'm going to share it there. Oh, so, uh, Eric already shared it. Thank you, Eric. So here it is. Oh, let me put this up here so it doesn't. Uh, ah, boy. Hold on. Oh, here it is. Okay. So the Great American Chili Highway, and I'm going to shrink this. So it's just me. Oh, even better. A palate scorching. And it's going to start off with this awesome, awesome marquee. This is Corrine's Mexican Restaurant in Walsenburg, Colorado. So I'm just going to scroll really quick. You can see this. A palate scorching Mexican hamburger and alabada field road trip up I-25 from Las Cruces to Denver. So here, uh, you know, uh, Charlie's is a classic in Las Vegas, New Mexico. That Oh, that alabada is absolutely amazing. You can tell the flour tortilla right there. It's bigger. It's huge, especially for those of us from Southern California. This is not a flour tortilla we've ever had. It's just, it's a whole other thing. Just scroll down, scroll down. That's in uh, Las Cruces, green chili sundae. It's really, really good. They put pecans in it. Um, hold on, scroll. We got to get to, it goes on and on. This is a Philly green, a Philly cheesesteak green chili and truth or consequences, New Mexico. It's, it's good. Not the best, but it's good. Scroll on and on. That's right there in Socorro, New Mexico. But we're trying to get to Colorado, of course. On and on and on. There's Raton, New Mexico. That was really good. Piñon brittle with some, uh, not this one didn't have green chili. That's actually a good coffee shop, Enchanted Grounds. And then here we are in downtown uh, in Trinidad. Trinidad, by the way, really cool little town. I could not spend much time there, but I was able to go to this uh, place called Tony's Diner. So in Tony's Diner, it's an Italian restaurant. Spaghetti, all that stuff. But to tell you, to show you how much you have this fusion of cuisine, at Tony's Diner, you can get a side of red or green chili, or better yet, something that I don't even see in restaurants in New Mexico, Chile Caribe. So there it is, Tony's Diner with the flour tortilla. Oh, 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 what did I just do? Here we go. It's actually, we can, can we make it bigger? I thought you did. Oh, there it is. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to make a big one. Sorry. There you go. Chile Caribe. I still can't really explain what chile caribe is other than it's freaking good. The way I explained it here is red chili made with dried peppers instead of fresh, with, which creates a spicier, deeper flavor. It was absolutely awesome. I had it with a bowl of uh, spaghetti, put it on there. I wish I could have spent more time there, but I did this, by the way, all on all in one day. So then I go to Corrine's. Corrine's has been there since 1957. There I ordered something called the pollo de Colorado. It was basically fry, almost like... Chicken milanesa for uh, those of you who are familiar with it, or basically fried chicken strips with uh, covered, smothered in a red chili. Um, it tasted like Mexican schnitzel. I go to this restaurant called Three Sisters of the Honky Tonk in Colorado City. There they had a bowl of, this is where I started seeing the Pueblo style green. And I loved it because it was, it, uh, well, I'll get to the Pueblo style green. Um, and so, okay, I actually, I'll, I'll save the, the whole thing with the, the Pueblo uh, pepper for uh, my conclusion. But more restaurants I shouted out. Gray's Course Tavern, another classic beer bar. A lot of bars in Pueblo, which made sense because of the mining, of the mining, or not the mining, the, the mills that were there, uh, you know, the mills, uh, Pittsburgh of the West in Pueblo. Uh, Gray's Course Tavern. So the most famous dish that if, 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 if Americans know anything about Pueblo style food nationally, it's going to be for a dish called the slopper. And the slopper is basically going to be a version of a green chili cheeseburger, except usually, at least the way I found it, it's going to be the hamburger patties. Maybe you put it in cheese, and then it's completely smothered in a green chili. And here, when I'm talking, for those of you who are not from Colorado or New Mexico, when we're talking about chili now, it's not chile, it's not the chili pepper, but it's like a gravy, like a chili gravy. So at Grace Course Tavern, the chili is, oh, it's a beautiful chili. It has sort of like the tone of like light avocado, even though it has no avocado in it. It's savory, it's spicy, it's wonderful. I talked about Polito's Beer Barrel, Estela's Mill, Mill, Estela's Mill Stop Cafe. So you can see it right there. Look at this wonderful tostada. Look at how thick it is. It's like puffed up and fried. And what's, and there's a um, chili, chili right here, the red chili, old school with the olive on top. And what I think is so fascinating, that's arroz right there. That's your Spanish rice, except it's, it was saucy in a way I've never had it before and I've never seen. I'm just going to, uh, you know, log that up to the Italian influence. It was almost like, you know, like, like a sauce, like Italian sauce on the, on this uh, Mexican style chili or rather, rather Mexican style rice. 
Bingo Burger, really great place for hamburger. They there they had a really great green chili uh, hamburger. Then I had to, I, but by then I'd been, I'd eaten at fifteen different places eating nothing but chili, so I was gonna die. I and it wasn't no digestive tract problems or anything, but my skin was like super super hot. It was very very uncomfortable. So I ended up in Colorado Springs. I took a cold shower and then I got ready for the next morning. So I'm now so scrolling up. Pueblo, I, I, you know, at, in Colorado Springs, the two best restaurants who have Pueblo Chili and I, or Pueblo Mex is going to be a place called King Chef Steiner, which also has some fame nationally. There they serve Pueblo style chili. And then I really like a place called Rudy's Little Hideaway. Um, there they sell smothered burritos. And there they also have, um, uh, you know, just regular bur burritos that you could hold with, um, you know, with the Pueblo Chili inside. So now let's get to the Pueblo Chili debate. Um, which I'm going to stop sharing so you can see me again. And give me oh, another dog. Dogs, of course, making everything wonderful. Vegan sloppers, of course, because vegan, vegan Mexican food is ruling the world right now. But we'll get to that in a little bit. So at this point now in uh, the, the course of Colorado Mexican food, New Mexico, uh, New Mexican uh, or New Mexican Mexican food and whatnot, Pueblo has realized, you know, about a decade ago or so, hey, our Pueblo chilies are really good and hatch chilies down grown in Southern New Mexico, they're getting a lot of play nationally. We should start promoting our chili nationwide. So the Pueblo, uh, you know, the Chamber of Commerce and other folks in Colorado, they start like, they apply for a federal grant. They start uh, promoting their Pueblo chili. And of course, uh, and, and the other important thing, I've never been to it, but Pueblo loves its chili so much that they have a Chile and Frijoles Festival. Not a Chile and Beans Festival, a Chile and Frijoles Festival. I will go there one glorious day to check it out. And so the Pueblo Chile, it's been, like, if you're not from uh, New Mexico or whatever, it's gonna be like when it's grown, just like your green chili, they call it a Mirasorgo because when it grows, instead of growing down like a Anaheim chili, it grows up. Mirasor is look at the sun. It is delicious. I love it because it's hotter on average than other green chilies from New Mexico. It has a funkier flavor. It's like a pecan. For, uh, pecan means uh, spicy, but it has like this funky flavor to it that's absolutely delicious. And so when I finally start having it in earnest, I'm like, oh, this is another story. So actually, I, I gotta, I gotta um, go a little bit backwards. So the the green chili, uh, the chili highway story, published in 2019. But before that, I did a story for NPR about uh, what we're gonna talk about, which is the chili wars. So and I'm, I'm going to sh share this in a little bit. So as Pueblo's going around telling everyone, hey, we really have great, awesome green chili. People should check it out. New Mexico's going, what? You really think your pepper, your little Pueblo Mirasol pepper can dare compare to our hatch, to our chimayo, to our socorro and lemitar? Friendly rivalries are one thing. But the New Mexicans, man, and I love you, New Mexico. New Me I'm actually going to lecture for a, a, at a Santa, a, one of the museums in Santa Fe in a couple of months. So I love New Mexico. It's a whole thing. But stop bullying Pueblo and just accept the facts that when it comes to Hatch, and Hatch is the big chili growing region in New Mexico, the big one, that's the one that naturally, if you think of New Mexico peppers, you think of Hatch peppers, Pueblo peppers are better than Hatch peppers. Take it from the guy who has no... Like I have nothing to gain and everything to lose by having an entire state turn against me, but it is true, Pueblo peppers are better than hatch peppers. So I, I didn't know about this rivalry. I figured like, ah, eh, you know, whatever, it, like people like it. But once I find out about this rivalry, I then end up doing this story right here. The chili pepper rivalry heats up between New Mexico's hatch and Colorado's Pueblo. So there's some Pueblo chilies from Dito Maso Farms, which is one of the famous uh, chili uh, uh, farmers in, in uh, the San Luis Valley at the Chile and Frijoles Festival. I think there's another one right here. More, uh, here's more, the uh, some ristras and all that. So remember folks, the, the chilies from Colorado, the Mirasol, they are cousins to the chili from New Mexico. It is the same family, yet New Mexico it's all the same land without borders. There goes El Lucero. You, you, you know, you got that as well. I'll, I'll put the link right now. Yet New Mexicans, they will not have it. So I talked to the Pueblo Chieftain today and the, I told the Pueblo Chieftain, hold on, story. 
Arkansas River Valley. Thank you, Mike, for correcting me. Again, I am an interloper from here. So please correct me in the comments. Um, no, can you get one? Um, sorry. Uh, so New Mexico, so what I told the chieftain was that New Mexico is basically the older cousin who's, who's bullying the younger cousin. New Mexico should be telling the world, hey, we have an awesome cousin in Pueblo. The Mirasol pepper is absolutely delicious. It's absolutely amazing. Try it. Nope, they're not going to do that. Instead, they're like, nah, 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 like bullying. So here I come in peace from Colorado, uh, from um, Anaheim, California. And I say, New Mexico and Pueblo, create a truce. And if you want to make fun of someone, make fun of the Anaheim pepper. The Anaheim pepper is actually from New Mexico, um, uh, 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 California, Emilio Ortega. It's in my book. He actually traveled to New Mexico to you know, improve his health. He comes back with a pepper from Hatch, grows it, makes it its own thing, calls it the Anaheim pepper because that's where uh, uh, the farmers were in, New Me in Anaheim to be, or in, in Southern California to grow this pepper. And now the Anaheim pepper is, you know, at least it's, it's the thing. Sometimes people call, call it the Ortega pepper and whatnot. It's flavorless. It compares nothing. And I say this as somebody who was born and raised in Anaheim. It is flavor flavorless. It has nothing, cannot compare at all to Hatch. It cannot compare at all to Mirasol. It cannot compare at all to anything. So make fun of these people. Colorado food is New Mexican food. It's related to New Mexican food. Colorado food is different from, again, cousins are related. Are they brothers and sisters? No. Just like Tex-Mex food is a cousin to New Mexican food, is a cousin to Sonoran food, it's a cousin to Calmex food, is a cousin to food down in Mexico. The supremacy of New Mexico over Colorado Mexican food must stop now. I say this, I, bring, I am the peacemaker to this war between the two of you folks and say, and by the way, I mean, I could be mean, but I'm not going to be mean, but I am more about promoting the peace so you folks could then spread the gospel of Mirasol and Chimayo and Trinidad and Socorro and Walsenburg and all that stuff to the rest of the country. Please do that. Ha, huh? fair enough. There you go, Roberta. Exactly. Um, we're, I'm going to get to your question. I'm going to read some right there. No, don't worry, Mike. I, I'm always happy to be uh, corrected if I have things wrong. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to end this and I'm going to start answering your questions. But I do want to give a shout out, like, just to show you how little... Colorado Mexican food is known outside of Colorado. I could only think of one book that deals that, that was published on a on a national publication or rather a national press that deals with Colorado Mexican food. And I know the Pueblo Muse El Pueblo Museum has this book, but you should if, if you really care and want to know more about Colorado Mexican food, you got to get this book. A tortilla is like life. Food and River in the San Luis Valley of Colorado. It's a great book and it talks to mujeres uh, you know, who are from Colorado, there's this great section at the end where it talks about, oh, I just skipped it right here. Uh, you know, it's an appendix, wild plants used for food or healing in the Antonito area. So shout out to Antonito. Definitely check it out as well. I got to get to San Luis Valley for sure. Definitely check this out as well. So this one. And then this one, I got to talk to El Pueblo Museum, but I have, you know, I have fans. Thank you, fans. But uh, recently, a fan uh, from, or, uh, from uh, La Junta who moved to California a long time ago, she actually gave me this self-published memoir, Nana's Me Memoirs by Maria Boswell, born though, what is her name? Avila, Maria Avila born uh, 1936. So this is an amazing memoir of Colorado Mexican life in the 1930s in La Junta in Southern Colorado. She has recipes. She talks about how to make soap. She talks about, you know, the pig killing and all of that. So I hope the El Pueblo Museum has this. If not, I am more than happy to donate it to the El Pueblo Museum because it is important that people document their history. It is important that people find out about the, like their own history. And more important, it is important for you folks in Pueblo, in the Arkansas River, in the San Luis area, in the San Luis Valley, up in Denver, up in you know all the barrios, all you, know, all you Colorado Mexicans who are so often forgotten in the grander diaspora of Mexicans in the United States. It is important to tell your history. It is important to tell the world about your amazing cuisine. I'm gonna take another little sip of the Stranahan's. Ah, that's some good stuff. And it is time 
for you folks, <laughs> ooh, that's hot. It's time for you folks to start asking me questions right here. Why are people texting me? Oh, that's my wife. So John Stevens, uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you go to uh, the stories that I had shared earlier, I'll share this one again. Um, you'll get some of my favorites from uh, Pueblo, from Colorado, all that good stuff. Oh, there it is. Don beat me to it. So, oh, that's the bookshop. So please folks, buy the book, support the museum. But the, they're my favorites. I got to tell you though, those the, the Pueblo Chili, I need to go to this Chile festival just so I could have, buy a bunch of Mirasol. And I bought some in powdered form as well. So I have that in the pantry. I got to get more uh, tortillas, but Bolitos Beer Barrel, especially once uh, we can, I don't know how it is in Colorado. I don't know if you could dine inside yet, but we can't yet in California. But once I have a chance, I want to go get drunk, drive safe, of course, get an Uber, probably not Uber, but a friend, but just gorge on chicken tacos on white, get some tortillas, get some sloppers and just, um, Eat it. Absolutely. So thank you, Catherine. So folks, if you have any questions, please start having them on uh, the back. Can you talk about Fidel? So of course, this is supposed to be food of the borderlands. And this actually gets to Politos, uh, but we're focusing in Colorado. So one of the interesting dishes of the borderlands is Fidel. Basically, vermic angel hair, hair pasta, vermicelli noodle. I forget all those things. Um, but what, like Fidel is very much a home dish. Grow, I never see Fidel on restaurants in Southern California menus. But when I ended up in Pueblo, especially in Politos, as a side, instead of rice, some of the restaurants had Fidel, which I don't know how that came about, but I thought it was an amazing thing. So that's another thing for you, Pueblo, to be proud about, that you folks uh, like take pride in your Fidel, which is cool. Again, all Mexican families take pride in their Fidel, but to have it on restaurants, that's a whole other level of just awesome. So Fidel, very good. You make it kind of like, you kind of make it like Spanish rice. So it's tomato based. It's a very light, like it's basically your starch that goes with it. It's delicious. Sopa de Fidel, Sopa de Estrellas, exactly. Um, e asks, thank you for sharing these resources. I'm studying Mexican American history and my own Mexican American family's history in Colorado. So it's great to hear those recommendations. Absolutely, that's why I'm here. Nikki says to go to Martinez Cafe on Pope. When I get back to Pueblo folks, I'm telling you, I want to spend a good week just exploring Southern Colorado, going to San Luis Valley, going to Walsenburg, going to Trinidad, going to all these places. I want to gain 10 pounds just eating all this amazing food. So San Luis Valley, Emma's Hacienda, thank you. Best green chili stew ever. I got to get to Emma's Hacienda. That's wonderful. Uh, come to Berkey. Uh, yes, Rob Martinez. Of course, I usually go to New Mexico once a year. Of course, I wasn't able to this time because of Sonora, uh, Sonora town. That's another, that's a whole other lecture because of the pandemic. Um, Robert and Diego say, when in Pueblo, check out Tacos Navarro on Corner of Northern and crispy, ooh, crispy chicken tacos. Absolutely love it. But oh, Patty Calhoun from Westward, greatest alt weekly. Patty Calhoun is a Colorado living legend. She dares me to talk about Casa Bonita. So let's go back up to Denver for a little bit. If the United States knows anything, about Colorado Mexican food. It's two things, neither of which I think Colorado is proud of. One of them is chipotle. And we all know, of course, chipotle, big, humongous burritos, which is no longer in Denver, by the way. Now it moved to Orange County. Um, it just moved. And the burrito, I mean, in, in many ways, chipotle popularized the big fat burrito that's now all across the United States. But the guy who founded uh, chipotle, he grew up in Denver. He didn't even bother, or he, he moved to Denver in seventh grade. He did not even bother with the smothered burritos of Colorado. Instead, he got the mission style burritos from San Francisco, the, again, which is the Chipotle burrito, this big, humongous thing. So it is a disgrace that Chipotle had a, cha Chipotle had a chance to popularize Colorado Mexican food. Instead, they went with San Francisco. It is an absolute travesty. That's number one. The other one, of course, is Casa Bonita. And just in case you don't know what Casa Bonita is, I'm sure the people in Colorado do, but for the people outside of Colorado, it is this, think of Disneyland covered in yellow cheese. So this huge restaurant with all sorts of bizarre displays and a show to the fact, to the point where there's, um, you would have divers diving into a pool, kind of like the cliff divers of Acapulco. It is an absolute insane experience. Cartman from South Park, the other great uh, Colorado export uh, uh, nationwide. There was a whole episode about Cartman trying to get to Casa Bonita. It is, for a lot of people, it's just an atrocity. It is an embarrassment. 
but it is you, Colorado. Westward, I don't know if the story's up yet, Patty. If it is, put it on, um, on the, um, here on the chat. If not, there's going to be a story coming up about Casa Bonita. I talk about it in my book. <laughs> there it is, Casa Bonita. It's you, Colorado, or more Denver. Pueblo, of course, say like, nah, nah, I, we're good, fam. We're good. Uh, ooh, Mike says, have you had Botica, not Mexican, but Slovenian influence on Mexican food? I have not. I got to check that out next time. Wow. Uh, Mike says, heard that cumin and cinnamon are what makes Tex-Mex different from other Mexican food. Where does Tex-Mex stop and you Mexican food start? That is a great question. The border is El Paso. So El Paso, of course, is so far away from the rest of Texas that Texas doesn't even think it's El Paso or uh, Texas doesn't think El Paso is part of Texas. And El Paso is culturally more New Mexican than it is El Paso. The difference here is it's gonna be the chili. With Texas, the way they like their chili is in powder form, chili powder. So the cumin, yes, and cinnamon, you don't, you only see a little bit of cinnamon in like Tex-Mex food, more of a little bit more in cumin, but you see cumin in Mexican food, although not to the extent of Tex-Mex, but the, the difference in New Mexico and Texas, again, it's Texans like chili powder, New Mexicans and, uh, you know, El Paso, New Mexicans and Coloradoans, they love their chili fresh. They love their chili frozen. That's a big difference. That's what makes it so beautiful. So that's, so El Paso is a border right there in that case. Uh, Jason says, what were you saying about the vegan Mexican Renaissance? I don't know if it's out there in Colorado just yet, but in, you, in California, there's been a huge, uh, my dog's growling, of course. Please make him not growl. Um, well, Cosmo, you're right next to him. Um, that's my other dog. There's been this whole renaissance of vegans who grew up eating Mexican food, grew up eating meat, and they went vegan for various reasons, but they didn't want just to eat nothing but potato tacos or tofu. So they started experimenting. So I did, it, it was another uh, article that I did for, um, for NPR about the rise of vegan mechs. I'm running out of time here. So I, all I can say is Google Gustavo Ariano vegan mechs and be blown away. So talk about Arizona style food. That's a whole other lecture. We'll have to wait until Tucson, um, invites me, but what I will say about Arizona Mexican food, that's a different style of flour tortilla. There, it's thin, it's humongous, it's absolutely delicious. Instead of pork, the main difference in, in Arizona food, first of all, they don't call it Arizona Mexican food, they call it Sonoran cuisine because of the Sonoran desert, but there, the meat is beef, it is not pork, it is absolutely delicious. They also like their chili, but there, the, it's not a New Mexico style chili, instead it's a small little chili called the chiltepin, which is absolutely amazing, grows wild. So it's called, it's not called green chili stew, chili verde. Hey, L, some people call it a tamal. Some people call it tamale. Who cares when you're eating it? Everyone's different. God bless you for that. So cool. How did Comino become part of Mexican cuisine? Same way um, rice became part of Mexican cuisine. Same way um, pork became a Mexican cuisine. The Spaniards and all of that came, of course, well, not the pork, but the Moorish influence. Cumin comes from the Middle East. That's where it comes from. This is lightning round now, folks. Sopapillas, of course, Colorado. So sopapillas, again, another New Mexican thing, went up to Colorado. It's actually, it's, a, it's an interesting um, migration because it's, it's part of Tex-Mex cuisine, but only on the plains, going basically on I-40 on the panhandle. And it's definitely a part of Mexican food in Oklahoma, which is really Tex-Mex food, but a little bit different. So from, yeah, and El Paso too, because again, that New Mexican influence right there. Uh, spot on, thank you, Mike. Um, Megan says, Ariano, Megan Ariano. My bisabuelos, my great grandfather, parents migrated to Colorado from New Mexico and New Mexico around the turn of the 19th century. And it feels like a lot of our food was lost to acculturation. Have you noticed any common traits among Mexican American communities that regionalize their food traditions instead of losing them? A lot of it's being lost because now what you're seeing, of course, is Mexican migration coming in. Uh, you gotta, well, whatever. Um, you have a lot of my Mexican migration coming in and sort of, you know, Americans would usually try the Mexican food that was around them, which was the Mexican American style cuisine. But Americans now want this more regional food from Puebla, from uh, Chihuahua, from that. So a lot, like here in California, the Calmex tradition, it's dying. Those restaurants are fading away. I still see Pueblo Mex food still strong, but I think in a gen, because you know, it's a smaller town, but I think in a generation it's gonna be in danger. Patty Calhoun could talk about it. Denmex cuisine, it's slowly starting to get in danger. So eat that food while you have, especially if you come from that stock, 
Be like my fan. Write down those recipes. Keep them. Make sure your food does not disappear. Hey, there's Felicia. Hi, Felicia. Thank, thank you so much. An amazing actress, actress folks. She is a, a daughter of Pueblo right there. So any theories how Pueblo chili became gravy style? Maria, uh, Maria from New Mexico. Well, this is the thing. On the chili highway, you see different manifestations of chili. So in Texas, you have a, a gravy sauce. That's their version of a chili sauce. That, you know, from what I've understood from other historians, that was a way to, you know, to keep, you know, to make chili more filling. You put in some uh, baked, some flour in there, and all of a sudden this chili stew, uh, you know, the uh, green uh, chile verde, all of a sudden it becomes thicker. All of a sudden it makes you, uh, como se dice, it sticks to your ribs more so you don't have to eat as much uh, or you, you get filled faster. So was in history, Colorado, that's so awesome. More, more, more. Why aren't puffy tacos found outside of Texas? That's where my Tex-Mex panel, which I'll have at some point. Again, there. why isn't the Mexican hamburger outside of, um, of Denver? All, you know, some foods just do not travel. Why isn't the slopper found outside of Pueblo, but the green chili cheeseburger is not just in New Mexico, but other parts of the United States. Some food travels, some foods do not. Um, Elizabeth, people are putting the eater thing right there, usually has a, so Denver green chili usually has cumin. Can you please take them away, honey? All right, I guess we're almost done here. Thank you. My life is now complete thanks to the vegan sloppers. There you go. People are talking. I'm just going to go to the question. Of course, bizcochitos. How could I forget, Janine? Bizcochitos are like a tr classic cook shortbread cookie from, you know, classic shortbread cookie from uh, New Mexico. I'm sure up, it's in Southern Colorado as well. I have not had it there yet, but usually done around uh, Christmas time. Also, the other great uh, dessert uh, that I found in northern New Mexico cuisine, which I'm sure is in southern New uh, Colorado, panocha. I did not say a bad word, folks. Panocha is basically a pudding made from sprouted wheat. I'll leave it at that. It is absolutely delicious. That is made, though, usually only during Lent. Okay, I'm just trying to get to the questions right here. A lot of people. There you go. Yup. Uh, do you think there has been a rechazo of some indigenous native ingredients in the U.S. Mexican food, or how have they been preserved? Corn, you can't get more indigenous than that, folks. You know, tamal, the one of the oldest foodstuffs in the world that's basically unchanged, over 7,000 years old. Uh, Angie asked, cheers to Delilah, what's that whiskey? One final time, Stranahan's from Colorado. You could find it everywhere in Colorado. Rare, someone said hi to you. Hi. There's my wife wants some more. She likes that whiskey. And then one final thing, how did Anise get into bizcochitos? Not a flavor that has a traditional association with Mexican food. For once, I have no idea. All right, folks, I'm only ending early of the Italian dessert. So there you go, Nikki. Again, you folks know more. Anise is part of New Mexican cuisine. Thank you so much, folks. Uh, we're going to turn it back. Please donate to the Museum of Colorado. Please support Pueblo Max. Please, please, please. And then I'm going to put, if you're interested in anything more of what I have to say, please subscribe to my newsletter. I'm going to put my website right now so you can do it. New newsletter is gustavoariano.org. Gustavoariano.org. Thank you so much, folks. Here's Hut. Hey, Take thank you, Gustavo, <laughs> for joining us this evening. Uh, this was awesome. I know there were a lot of questions we probably that we didn't get to. Uh, for those of you uh, that are joining us that are interested in Gustavo's uh, um, newsletter and then all of the links that were shared, we'll send that out in the follow-up email after tonight's talk. Um, again, we want to thank you, Gustavo, this evening. Uh, I think everybody had a good time. Uh, for our audience members, we hope you will become a member of our Fronteras Borderlands of Southern Colorado Society and join us for Nick Science Talk on Wednesday, February 24th. The information is on the screen right now. The next Borderlands Talk um, is a settler colonial state with Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz uh, one month from today on Mar March 11th at 6 p.m. Tickets can be found at h-co.org backslash Borderlands Talks. And then finally, um, you can support History Colorado by purchasing Gustavo's book, along with dozens of other titles, like the Life is Like a Tortilla that he mentioned during his talk um, at our bookshop. Uh, History Colorado receives a commission from every purchase through our online store site, and you can find the site um, on, the, on the screen now. Again, want to thank you to the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area. Thank you to Colorado State University Pueblo and to all of our donor, donors and supporters for supporting public programming at all History Colorado Community Museums. Thank you all uh, and have a good evening. Thank you.